are. I'm so excited. I always love when Grant Station is here. And today we're going to be talking about integrating 2023, can you believe it, trends into your nonprofit. So we're going to learn all about the latest trends so you can take advantage of the grant seeking. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here. And I know you're very familiar how to engage today, but just in case you're not, if you need to use the closed caption, go ahead and tap on that CC button. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A and we're gonna answer your questions at the end. We are recording this. You will get all the slides and the replay um, within 48 hours of this presentation. I got one quick announcement to make, make on February 13th. Um, we're having a special webinar um, from datacommons.org. They're gonna show you how you can use public data to share stories about your nonprofit so you can make the most impact. And of course, we have the Grant Station sale that's gonna happen. You're gonna save $600 on Grant Station. You're gonna learn more about that throughout the webinar. I'm gonna pop a link in the chat. Um, the special start February 14th and 15th. And you can click on that link to get a reminder. I'm going to move out of the way and turn it over to Alice. She is the president of Grant Station. And we also have Cindy Adams here. She is the founder of Grant Station. So welcome, ladies, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Aretha, and welcome, everybody. Um, I think I'll have you on. There we go. Have you on share your screen. And I will share um, our presentation here. So I'm really excited uh, to have you all here to talk about what's uh, kind of going on in 2023 with grant uh, makers and what we're seeing as trends in the field so that you can incorporate this information into your strategies. So like Aretha said, we have a large crowd and we've got a huge uh, packed agenda. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy really quick so that she can talk about how you can kind of get the most out of this webinar. So take it away, Cindy. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Alice. And thanks, Aretha, uh, for the introductions. Um, and hello, everyone. I really appreciate your taking the time to join us today. Um, I am just a name because I uh, my internet is very, very slow and I live in a very remote area of southern New Mexico. And the internet here is, uh, the word I guess is dicey. Yeah, dicey is the word. Um, anyway, thank you for joining us today. And I suggest today that you just let the the information that we present, because it's going to be a lot, just let it flow over you. Maybe make a note over here or there and if something you know sparks a specific idea regarding the work that you're doing. But in general, just sort of sit back and absorb the information we're presenting. And as mentioned um, earlier, you'll, you'll receive the slides so you can reference those and kind of uh, refresh your mind as you go forward. And keep in mind that these trends aren't comprehensive. I mean, obviously. And we have left out some of the existing trends, such as racial justice, uh, racial equity, which is a very live and moving trend. But you're going to find that we're going to reference it throughout these other trends because it's being absorbed. It's actually actually a cultural shift, and we'll talk about that, but um, it's being absorbed in many, many other trends. So just be aware that that um, we're going to be hitting on a lot of different trends and that some of these trends encompass other trends that are happening out there, um, especially in leadership development. You'll see that leadership development really takes in many, many other trends. Excellent. Um, thanks, Cindy. So that's good advice. And so, um, uh, as you guys can see, we do have Aretha behind the scenes who can answer any of your TechSoup specific questions. And we have David Gates from GrantStation who can also answer any GrantStation specific questions. Uh, but like uh, Aretha said, feel free to put those questions in the Q&A and we will have those answered um, at the end of the presentation. So we do have a busy agenda, like we mentioned. And so what we're going to do is start talking about grant maker trends in two areas. In the area of interest, 
that grant makers are really looking to support. And then we're going to touch on some of the different ways that grant makers will support you through their types of support. And through those, there's more than what we'll talk about, but we will talk about general operating support and we will talk about capacity building funds because I know that those are probably the more common ones that you all will be looking for. So we will provide you with information on kind of how funders are defining these things um, and how um, with a lot of different examples that we'll sprinkle in and then also how you can weave this information into your grant proposals to um, increase your chance of success. Um, at the very end, we're just going to touch on uh, some of the tools that GrantStation has and then um, provide you with information to uh, how you can get more information on our tools and other TechSoup tools and the promotion that we've been talking about. Um, and you know, Alice, it, it would be great. It would be great if um, as we go through the trends, if everyone could note a project that they need funding for and then ask us how we might integrate one or more of these trends into those requests. Anyway, okay, Alice, I'm ready. Absolutely. Let's rock and roll. Yep. Perfect. Um, so we're going to talk about these uh, trends that are here. I'm not going to read them all to you because we're going to go through them one by one, but kind of how funders, like I said, are looking to support these types of efforts. Um, we'll go through them one by one, but like Cindy has already said, they also can connect in a lot of different ways. So kind of as we go through, you'll see how some of the information kind of connects to some of these other trends. And again, how you can um, look at this information and include it in your applications. So we're going to start with building movements. And usually, you know, when we kind of think of a movement, we tend to really think big, you know, a big movement like we're seeing um, on these screens. Um, but that isn't really the case. It doesn't have to be a big giant movements like like um, uh, Black Lives Matter or working with the UN sustainability goals. It can also be smaller community based. Um, movements that you're looking towards um, of just taking back your your neighborhood or your streets and making them safer or helping bikers get bike lanes, you know, on the streets um, for safety and things like that. So they can be, you know, rather large or they can also be smaller, just community based. But really the, the trend and the key here is that grant makers are really interested in those movements when you can demonstrate that they're creating that local change. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, one is by kind of tagging on to other movements that you see going on in your community, or you can create your own movement, um, which doesn't sound really easy. So I'm going to make Cindy, ask Cindy to do the hard part of giving us examples of how we would do that on a local level. Sure, sure, Alice. I'll I'll take that on. I'll take that challenge. <laughs> um, but uh, first, before we before I give an example, and I will give you an example, you guys. But but first, let me just sort of clarify that there are really two types of movements that your organization might take on. Um, one and and the names for them are really reformative. One is a reformative social movement, and the other is what they call revolutionary movements. So there are really two distinct types of movements, and there's others as well. But the, but these are the ones that your the a nonprofit would probably embrace or take on. And a reformative social movement is really mainly um, what we're talking about today. You're seeking to change the the social structure. So if you're you're targeting it in, you know, oftentimes you're targeting an entire population when you're doing some kind of reformative social movement. And that might just be a neighborhood or it might be a larger community, um, you know, a state or a, a country, right? And, and that's a movement. And I was part of a, the environmental movement in the 70s and 80s in Alaska. And much of our funding for the work we did came from the national funders recognizing that this was a real movement that was happening in that state. 
And then there's this other type of movement, which is a revolutionary movement. And that seeks to change every aspect of a society in a very dramatic way. That's why it's called revolutionary. Um, and that, and a good example of that is really the, the civil rights movement. And if you guys want, uh, towards the end, if you think you're working on building a movement, you can ask me sort of the stages of what a movement, what goes into movement, I can share that with you as well. So just put that in the back of your mind. But getting to that example that that Alice, you asked me to share, um, uh, let's say you live in a rural area and you're trying to form a farmer's market to get residents of that area to eat more nutritionally, live healthier lives, you know, strengthen the local economy, that kind of thing. One way to build a movement and to demonstrate to the funder that the support they offer will allow you to launch this movement or to build onto a movement you've already launched is to really identify or bring in key collaborative partners. And that in this case, it could be a set of you know, farmers. It could be a local, well, I don't know, garden club, um, maybe a few nurseries, you know, businesses, maybe the Chamber of Commerce and perhaps even the regional clinic since nutrition is important part of this whole thing. You just need to get their buy-in and build your proposal partially, partially on the strength, strength of this collaboration that you pull together, right? That will focus on this local change. Then in your proposal, you can develop a simple, nothing, nothing too elaborate. It doesn't have to be pages and pages, but you know, sort of a simple outreach plan for each of these partners. So you don't want to just list the partners. You want to demonstrate how they will be involved in this movement, how, how they're going to take part as one of your partners. Now, this is just a piece of an of an overall request, obviously asking the funder to support the development of the farmer's market, but it can be a very, very key ingredient. And I, I really like, Cindy, that you added that because, you know, funders really do want to see that you have that plan of action um, and not kind of just the platitudes of we're going to do this. Um, and they really want to see it. And so you want to make sure that you are you know, discussing how um, you're going to build that movement and the steps you're going to take. And then also tying that together with what you're talking about with all those different partners is really also um, demonstrating their commitment to the process. So really showing them that you're actually partnering, actually building off different community assets and, um, you know, really make this part have teeth, you know, that, that you're actually doing this and yes, not just providing yes. that lip service, I think is really important. So um, lots around there. And we're going to see this kind of some of these themes through some of our other topics as well. Um, so the second area that we're going to talk about is in developing leaders. And so grant makers are, you know, really eager to develop new leaders that, again, truly reflect um, what's going on, um, what communities they are serving. So kind of the days of, you know, having your target population simply as, you know, one member on your board or having one listening session where you have your um, committees or your advocates talking about what's needed. Um, that we they really want to see those that you're serving involved in that and developing those leaders. And you know that can be tricky um, depending on on what you know your your uh, what you've been doing in the past because you might find that you need to engage um, new leaders and you've never done that before. So how do you figure out, you know, who should you, um, you know, reach out to? Who's interested in becoming a leader that you can coach or train? Um, and I'm going to, I like how I can do these hard questions to Cindy because she's the smart one here. Um, <laughs> right. um, you know, right. that, yeah, <laughs> it seems like there's a little bit of gap here, though, that, that, you know, funders will pay for that development of those leaders. But if you've never done it before, how do you identify them, Cindy, to include in your requests? Huh. Well, I, I agree, Alice. I think there is a bit of a gap here, a, a gap in logic when it comes to this kind of um, 
the leadership development. Uh, I think if you've already identified a set of leaders that you'd like to, you know, provide leadership training to, that's great. That's great. But be sure and note in your proposals how you identified them, how you figured out who you were going to put into this leadership training, you know, um, program that you're developing or whatever it is. You know, what was the process you used? And if you find yourself sort of scratching your head, which makes my head itch, actually. But anyway, scratching your head and then maybe, you know, and having to sort of step back and think, hmm, what did I do here? How did we come up with these folks? Then you may want to consider, you know, really taking a step back and perhaps going through a more methodical process, identifying individuals or groups of individuals that need training. So for example, let's say you live in a in an urban area and you know you need, I don't know, more elected officials to represent the underrepresented populations of this area, you could write into your proposals a methodology for how you will recruit the individuals from this underrepresent from this underrepresented community. Um, and, and of course, these days, it's always smart to include both face-to-face -face trainings and recruitments, as well as online training and recruitment. So just keep that in mind, too. But it's, it's smart, 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 you guys, to, to include and have a methodology for identifying these potential new leaders. And, and I think, Cindy, that really does tie into like what we were just speaking about, where funders want to see, you know, what steps you're taking, again, really putting that story behind what you're doing so they know it's not just, um, again, platitudes, but that you actually have a plan to do this work um, and, and what steps you're going to take. Um, so I think- And that, Alice, you know, Alice mm -hmm. yep. yeah, if I could just interject here, um, yep. I- I think that sometimes th that's where we get hung up. We don't know how to develop a method or a process that we feel is, is you know, equitable or clean or easy to implement, but will have good results. And I just want to suggest to people, because I've done this in the past, that if you're running into that problem, consider talking with your local university because oftentimes they will have courses or classes that are looking at this kind of thing and will help you come up with a way of identifying or creating a methodology, um, especially science, science researchers in this area. What, what are my step-by-steps? How do I do this so I'm really covering the, the most ground and bringing in those underrepresented populations. Uh, sorry to bust in, but I just had to say that. <laughs> that's all right. I think that's, a, I mean, our universities are great untapped resources to help us um, in, in a lot of different areas and, and make, uh, you know, bigger shifts um, by using those resources. So I think that's a great idea. Um, so kind of tied with this as well is shifting cultures. Um, again, you're going to see a lot of similar themes running through here, but um, you know, philanthropists, you know, if they recognize it or not, they really are all doing this kind of shift in culture, or at least trying to. Um, and kind of like, you know, the, the building movements thing we were talking about, it can be big shifts or small shifts um, or somewhere in between. So um, just as an example, a small shift in a culture might just be getting your own staff or the people that work around your project to think differently about a topic and and or to you know work with your mission um, it, with a different perspective um, and and an example of that that I've worked a lot with this kind of internal shift that has to go on is is around stigma reduction in um, like substance abuse um, areas and addictions. Um, and I've seen a lot of times in, let's say, a, a hospital setting or a private practice setting where there really needs to be a better understanding of what people um, with addictions are kind of struggling with. And the staff needs to be um, educated about that to make that shift. Um, and so, you know, I've seen that, you know, real positive shift when that 
you know, education is done and, um, and, and, you know, people are really looking at things in a different way than they did before this education or training. So, so Alice, could you tell us a little bit more about this? I mean, how did you, so I, I, I heard you'd mentioned this, uh, a couple of times before, but I've just heard, I've just been on the periphery of a, of a conversation. So how did you, how did you achieve this shift in, you know, understanding and, and getting this, getting the staff to, I don't know, engage more? I mean, was there a proposal you wrote around it? I mean, how did, how did this all work? You know, so usually the way it started, and again, using that same example, was um, whoever was kind of providing the treatment, if you will, the the, the folks that were working around that part, um, saw in the other staff at the facility that people were really, you know, that that the that the that the participants weren't treated well by the staff um, because they just they did, didn't understand addictions very well. And so what made it work though, I think it, that's really critical here is that they started like peer to peer education. So to kind of change that culture, they did it, you know, within the system. Um, and, and then, you know, some, you know, of the staff were presenting information on, um, you know, the science of addictions in a more non-threatening way of like, this is the way you should do it, but like more peer to peer oriented. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then that the, the, you know, the nurses being taught by other nurses then were more apt to make that shift um, than if it was coming kind of top down heavy. Um, right, and then, right. yeah. And then I think the other thing though, that's also kind of real important with like those kinds of things and probably, you know, other big external ones is just that you have to do it continuously. Um, it couldn't just be kind of a one and done. We're going to come in and do this. Like they had to right. build this in um, so that right. that was a, a shift that stuck, if you will. That's, that's really interesting, Alice. Um, I, I, I also think, I mean, I, I can see what you did there and it was a smart move. Just a sort of a side question. Was it, was this actually funded by a, a grant maker, this move and this shift in culture? They did as part of the, um, the it didn't have to be a separate proposal in this, I, okay. in this particular example. Um, they were able to just do it um, with funding they already had um, and, and then shift, you know, shift the focus out from just their participants to the larger system. Um, but when you report that back to a funder, you know, they like to see that, yeah. right? They didn't know they had to yeah. do it at first, but then the funder was really happy with the results of what they were able to do. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I also think there's sort of a, a you know, ex externally, we're seeing grant makers interested in broader cultural change, but this is trickier than shifting internal internal organizational culture isn't it <laughs> it's a yes. bit different it's a bit trickier i mean attempting a cultural change or a shift in your own community that that could be tricky business um, if you intend to do this you really have to clearly define a set of desired outcomes um, desired changes in behavior desired changes in values right um, it was interesting in today's Chronicle of Philanthropy, Alice, the headline was, I'm going to get it wrong, but it was something like 28 foundation, foundations urge you know, their peers to channel more funds to um, Black-led nonprofits, you know, yes, and I that's, that that's where yeah. you're getting it. Yeah, that's a real yeah. shift. That's you're really pushing a shift in culture. And I, when I think of... Um, cultural or societal change that happened within the you know the United States I always think of that the anti-litter campaign do you remember are you are you am I too old and you're I too remember young? the commercials <laughs> I do remember the commercials <laughs> okay there you go um okay. it there it was really it was an interesting story actually there's a really interesting story interesting story behind the campaign which isn't so cool but anyway not to divert us but the campaign truly truly worked and our whole society made a significant shift in behavior 
you know, there were many corporations who funded this and supported this cultural shift, uh, mainly because it was their products that were being picked up along the side of the road or on the sidewalks or in people's yards. But that campaign teaches us the importance of really understanding um, what category of grant maker you can tap into if your campaign is, is you know, for example, in this case, it was something that was really important to businesses. So the campaign tapped into business, business and, you know, corporate giving as their, as their main areas. Anyway, it was just, it was just interesting. I think that that campaign really made a huge cultural shift in our, in our society, which has lasted for a long time. I think maybe time to do it again, but yeah, I think it lasted yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's so much now just kind of ingrained um, that you don't think of it as a campaign anymore, but that's because it became right. kind of the normal operating procedures, if you will, in, in yeah. people's minds as to not throwing, you know, stuff on the streets and this and that. So, yeah. Okay. So our next trend is about developing an inclusive economy. So um, we all know that like racial equity uh, truly walks hand in hand with economic equity. And more and more uh, grant makers are really looking um, at proposals to make sure um, that the things that you're proposing um, really do develop that inclusive economy. Um, and again, tied back to some of the things we've said before that we again have those specific tactics outlined as to how we're going to address them. Again, not just saying we're going to, but showing those steps. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of, you know, what has happened in the past, um, that there has been, you know, yes, we have, um, uh, you know, equitable policies in our organization, but we were never kind of forced to demonstrate it. Um, and, and I think now funders are really, you know, saying, show me how you're walking the talk. And I think that that's really great. Um, and so when we're looking at some of these issues around inclusive economies, um, I found that the, um, the NAACP website has a lot of great information that you can go and um, look through and read to integrate into your um, proposals as to, um, you know, especially if you're working on any sort of, you know, community or economic development project, um, you know, how your uh, integrating different strategies to make that inclusive. Yeah, that is a good that is a good website, Alice. Um, I like it too. I've used it. I use it as reference many times. Um, and then, and I think there's another way of looking at this trend, and it's quite um, quite simply providing. If you look at it as providing more opportunities for more people, right? Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation defines inclusive economies by by five different interrelated characteristics. They say, you know, participation, equity, growth, sustainability, and stability. Those are the five things on which they judge if a proposal is really um, looking at, is really um, creating an inclusive economy. And I think any project focusing on workforce development or economic justice issues needs to really embrace those five characteristics. And if someone wants to look at those, you can just go to the Rockefeller Foundation website and look for um, you know, inclusive economy and you'll see a whole bunch of information there. But those five characteristics are listed too. Um, I also believe we're seeing sort of a sea change in society's approach to racial equity. It's not just a, it's not just a trend anymore but rather it's becoming a significant change in how our society thinks and acts. So it's, it's a movement per se, um, and hopefully will eventually be as commonplace as you know the recycling uh, has become commonplace, right? Okay. Everybody adopts it, you think about it. It's gotta be that important. It's gotta be that ingrained in our society. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, you might look at different organizations where they had a diversity or an inclusion program or a, you know, a diversity initiative, right? And I think that that's not where this is. It's not about something separate 
you know, that you're doing over here, but your organization is operating over here. It's like, how is that um, yeah. woven into the fabric of your organization and all that you do? Um, so it's very intentional. And, and like you said, you know, part of the way things go, not separate. Yeah, I like that you say intentional, Alice. That's exactly, exactly what it needs to be. Absolutely. Um, I think our next trend of defending democracy also kind of uh, goes hand in hand with some of this, um, where, you know, um, grant makers are really um, looking at the trend of focusing on defending democracy. And that can be, um, you know, here in the U.S. or, you know, abroad. Um, I think the trend is is pretty uh, widespread. Um, I know we have a few people on here from other places, so I don't think this is only a U.S. thing. Um, and while, you know, your most organizations, I mean, some do, but most organizations aren't going to have defending democracy as their, uh, you know, in their mission statement, you know, or or the main activity that they're doing. I think that one of the things that we want to do is to take advantage of this trend is just incorporating democratic approaches all across the board in the work that we're doing. Um, so like this could be something like um, just making sure that underserved communities are kind of aware and invited into the process to share their concerns, help develop um, the approaches, you know, really get involved in it. Um, you know, anything around, again, you know, back to those community and economic development projects like, that you're really involving those that you serve, you're getting their voice so that you know that that you're developing the best um, approach possible to make the most difference. Um, so, Cindy, do you have any other ways that 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 we could yeah. weave this into? Yeah, 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 I do. Um, I think there are a number of strategies that we could use to be weaving, you know, we could weave, as you say, into our grant request, knit. We're going to knit it. <laughs> We're going to thread it. <laughs> We're going to do something to do with fabric. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, that is right. Um, it, 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 to help sort of alter the current disintegration of democracy right here in the U U.S., um, just as an example, if you're working in the area of climate change, then defending um, democracy is the elephant in the room, so to speak, and should be addressed in your proposals. Um, did you know, I mean, I read this a couple of days, well, a couple of weeks ago, but did you know that something like the oil and gas industry has put something like an average of $4.3 million into every Senate seat that they want to be elected? Or I think it was like a half a million dollars in, into every house seat, right? So we're, it's, it's um, you know, your whole approach to defending democracy has to be woven into the work that you're doing, whether it's environmental work, whether it's racial justice, whatever it is, it has to be woven into it. And we're actually seeing um, environmental and racial justice groups coming together to, to address these threats um, to democracy. Um, we've seen that you know, several times that's been happening in the last couple of months, actually, or even you know, years for sure, but months. And um, Alice, just a side note, in the 1980s, and again, here I show how old I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the 1980s, um, we put together, I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we put together what we called May Day for Human Rights, which is, you know, of course, we were way before our time, so to speak. Um, we just felt like there were so many organizations, um, so many different groups in our community, veterans uh, at that time, it was from, you know, Vietnam War, women's groups, environmental organizations, all the, the entire Black community, the entire Asian community that were just being sidelined. And so we put together this march, myself and my husband and a friend, and we pulled together this May Day for Human Rights. And we had the veterans were marching with the women's organization, marching with the environmental organizations. The Black Baptist Church led the whole march. 
Um, and we had uh, every, almost every population you can imagine that was sidelined in that community, marching in that. It went on forever. And this is a small community. Grant uh, Fairbanks was probably 70,000 people at that time. So, but the beauty of it, Alice, the beauty of it was that what happened was, I don't know how much it changed the people that were watching the march, but I know that it empowered those of us in the march. And what we did is we started showing up. These groups started showing up at city council meetings, at, at borough assembly meetings, you know, working on political campaigns. So it became a whole thing. And it changed the, it changed the culture of that community. Anyway, I'm sorry, that was a sideline. Yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, I think that's a great example. And I think, again, we're seeing like how all these different, you know, movements or part of that is almost like developing leaders in a way. And so how these aren't distinct necessarily, but they're, they, they can really merge together. Um, and, and some of those, that, that example really demonstrates that. Um, so thank you for that, for that real life example. Um, our next one is place-based philanthropy. And so we are seeing a shift, um, with grant makers kind of focusing a little bit more on place-based philanthropy. That's kind of hard to say. Um, but I'm going to read you, um, a definition. Well, it's actually on the bottom of the page there. Um, but what does that mean? You know, so uh, it's defined as an approach that targets a specific location. So it could be your neighborhood or your town or your uh, county or multiple counties or a region, but upon which then they focus their charitable resources to make a, a transfer, a transformative impact. So taking an area and taking those resources and, <clears throat> excuse me, building it together um, that the trend is to focus on the geographic area, bringing together those local partners that we've kind of talked about in some of these other examples, and then how they can leverage the different partners um, in, in their different financial capital that they have, or social networks, or expertise, or human capital, or volunteers to address um, really complex issues. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink there, Cindy. If you'll just take a take a pop at that. Yeah, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. I'll take it. You swig your water. It, it is water, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so For now, now. make her choke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to say a few things about place based philanthropy that maybe we haven't really touched on. Um, I think it, it sounds like something that that this is something that grant makers are doing, right? And how do you pull the grant maker into this in your proposals? You have to make the case for the funders to target a specific location, like a neighborhood or a rural community, your town, your village, your city, um, re via a specific issue. So you've got to make that case that if they focus on this specific, specific issue, in this targeted community that they can make a change. That means you have to break down the complexities around a specific issue and show how you'll, you know, how you'll tackle sort of the root causes. Mm -hmm. And then you have to identify a comprehensive approach to um, tackling the issue and show how your work, the work that you're going to be doing will really generate um, lasting, uh, transformative, I kind of hate that word because everybody using it, but it's true, you know, generate lasting, transformative change within that chosen community. And this means the funder or the funders need to be brought in early via your discussions. Um, they really do have to, uh, you know, what, I, what I've been encouraging people to do that want to make a significant change in their neighborhood or their community is before they ever start proposal writing, before they ever start um, the complete planning process, they may have concepts in place, but before they really start that, bring grant makers to the table to discuss the issue. Because if the grant maker is um, invested in this early on, 
um, I mean, you're really talking about place-based philanthropy because you're talking about focused change in a, in a specific area, but you don't have to call it that. And I think that a lot of grant makers will um, be excited and want to engage, especially if they're brought in early on. They may never fund you, but they may introduce you to others that will fund you, right? So you're not asking them for money. You're asking them to engage in the conversation. And I, I think that they can, to... yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> but I, I think that tying on to that real quick, that, that you know, you bring them in, they're gonna introduce you, they're gonna provide some credibility, you know, to get other people to the table because they are um, funders. Um, so bringing right. them in early is great for that reason as well. And then once people start that buy-in of, okay, we're getting together, then you can bring in, you know, again, some of the things we've already talked about and bringing in government sources and nonprofits and businesses and, and collectively um, looking at this area and what you can do collaboratively using the assets of everyone involved. Um, because one, right. you know, one nonprofit maybe can't make all the difference, um, but you have government agencies who have resources, but they don't move fast. You know, and then you have businesses who can take a little bit more risk. And then you have the nonprofit folks really on the ground. So once you kind of bring together all those resources, yeah, I think it's, you know, it can be a really effective um, trend. Um, and and again, weaving in all these different um, trends that that funders want to see funded. Right, exactly. And I think that, I mean, I think sometimes this idea of place-based philanthropy can actually scare a few grant makers off. So I don't know if I would use that terminology <laughs> necessarily okay. yeah. um, be because I think that grant makers, sometimes they get, um, they're afraid they're going to get too involved a and they can get too involved. In fact, I've seen funders get so involved that they're basically running the project. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want funder to get too involved. You don't want them to get too focused on what you're doing. You want them to be a partner in what you're doing. So, you know, uh, I just think that you, it, it's just important that that people understand that those of you that are seeking that kind of focused grant making from local funders that you maybe steer a little away from the terminology place based um, because it might scare them off. Uh, they, they may think they have to get too involved. So it can be just a little worrisome, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I think our, our next, um, our next topic as well, um, being collective impact or collective action mm -hmm. actually yeah. fits with this very well. Cause it's like what we were just, um, talking about. Um, so again, this is where the same kind of situation we were talking about, where you take those, um, really strategic structured partnerships, you bring them all together and you unite, um, uh, you know, to to address um, again, address address a location, or address a movement, or you know, any of the other things that we've already talking about, and getting them united with that shared agenda. Mm -hmm. um, again, is what funders do like to see because they really see how uh, you're better positioned as a group to address some of those bigger social issues. Right. Um, I think we see all types of collective impact, as they call it, happening. You know, when funders come together to, I don't know, to attack a social or maybe an environmental issue, it results in what they, that actually almost always results in what they call collective action. So collective impact, collective action, it's, a, you know, they're words that are being thrown around out there, and you may want to include them in your your grant proposals as you write them because it's going to resonate. Uh, a lot of these funders go to conferences and they talk, they'll have whole panels on collective action and collective impact. So using some of that terminology can actually help uh, when you're writing a proposal. But when you do write a proposal, you want to base your project's impact um, on, on this model that we've sort of put here on the, on the slide. And you, you have to have that common agenda. Um, when you're working with other folks, if you're if you're bringing if you're developing a collaborative of any kind, you have to have a common agenda, and you have to demonstrate in your proposal that that agenda has been signed off on. So, quoting from a meeting that you've held, 
with um, a motion that was passed that adopted the agenda and was signed on by all these people, you know, it was unanimous approval, that should be in your proposal because nothing weakens your proposal more than the grant maker realizing you just don't have it. You know, you, you don't have that commitment, commitment from everybody. And then shared measurements, um, you know, mutually reinforcing activities need to be called out in your proposal. You know, what are you going to do? How, are, how is this group going to help this group? And how is this group going to work with this group? And then you need to adopt and articulate how there will be continuous communication amongst the partners. And then, of course, strong leadership is needed. So, yeah, I know we need to move on. We're probably running short on time, Alice. Yeah, so, we are running oh, short. Okay. Cindy, you're waxing okay. long. Now I'm just teasing. I'm waxing long. I love to hear it. Now. I love to hear it. So, yeah, so I do have just a resource for you guys from this. If you go to Collective Impact, um, the website Collective Impact Forum. You can go to their website and they have a set of kind of tools. If you're, you know, looking to how do you do all those things that Cindy just spoke about, you can do like a little self-assessment um, on their website and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of good resources to help you move forward in this area. Um, so our last uh, type or our last area of interest trend that we're going to talk about is true diversity, um, which really, you know, true diversity means embracing kind of the, the diversity of all the unique traits and backgrounds and perspectives and experiences of really each individual. Um, and it really offers um, an organization you know, a way to really advance their missions and make, you know, every person feel like they, they matter or they belong to the process, you know, that process of change. Um, and so it's really, you know, it can be um, like we spoke about, you know, long-term, short-term types of things, but really, um, you know, it's the best way by, by really using the diversity of your community and those that you serve it's the best way to really fully achieve what it is that you're trying to achieve in, in um, uh, your programs and to fulfill your mission. Um, and you know, uh, Alice, it also, and I'm just gonna mention this real quickly and then I'll let you move on. But I just wanna mention that true diversity is, is now, um, there's something called fair chance hiring. And if anyone wants to, it's really a growing trend. It's, it's called fair chance hiring. And it really promotes a way to help um, hire people that have not been brought into the workforce easily, like in those that have been incarcerated um, in, in the past. Ooh, that's a great example. Okay, so now we're going to move along to um, the two different types of support that there's other types of support, but we're just going to talk today about general operating support and capacity building support and see where funders are trending on those two topics. Um, so with regard to general operating support, you know, the with the pandemic just recently, you know, uh, raging and, and uh, uh, impacting all the work that that the nonprofit community has done. Um, one of the really positive trends that I've seen is that grant makers really started actually providing that general operating support, kind of with no strings attached, just kind of saying, okay, you need the money. We, you know, here, here's what you need to operate. Um, so, you know, at the time when that was happening, um, you know, those of us on this side of the, the the field here, we were really hoping that this would stick, that that general operating support would stay. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I'm a little worried that I don't think, I think that funders have kind of switched back um, mm -hmm. as, re, you know, the, the pandemic recovery has happened to um, really kind of go back to not op providing as much of that general operating yeah. support. You know, yeah, I think what uh, I think what you're saying, Alice, is spot on. I mean, I think it, it, there are a lot of the grant makers that did provide general support are backing away from it. But interestingly, many family funds that provided flex, um, flexible support during the pandemic, uh, their reasoning uh, 
you know, behind that was just because they would, didn't want to see these institutions fail. And they still feel that way. And I think a lot of them got kind of intrigued by this idea of general operating, but it really comes down to trust. You know, can these funders trust the organization to continue to invest their general support in addressing their overall mission? Yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, I think that, I mean, I hope, and I really do hope that, you know, while we've had seen the shift back a little bit, like that, that we, but we've seen the tides swing. So people saw some of the benefits of this general operating support. And once, you know, nonprofits and those funders, and like you said, family funders, as, as one example, as they've developed that relationship, you know, maybe they're going to continue with providing more of those general how to keep the lights on dollars for nonprofits. Yeah. So while it's switched so back, too. hopefully it, it's still a positive trend. Yeah, it's a positive trend. And, and I think that everyone just needs to remember that trust equates to honesty. So when you're writing your proposals for general operating, don't be shy about saying, giving them the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know? Let them mm -hmm. know the good you're doing. Let them know the things you're, the challenges you're facing. And if you've had some ugly times, share it with them. Because that, that kind of honesty is what these, especially these family funds, are really looking for. Absolutely. I think that that's a really, really great, great information. Um, so the next and last slide and trend that we're going to talk about is capacity building. And while I could probably go on for hours and hours, I won't do that to you. Um, <laughs> but um, I do feel that this is also a trend that, that's become uh, more front and center um, since the pandemic. Um, with funders really looking at how to build the infrastructure of organizations to support their work into the future. And while this has always been a bit of a trend, I, I do feel like with the pandemic, funders, um, even if they're not using the word capacity building, they are more um, apt, if you will, to really build you know, short-term capacity of building an organization on to longer term capacity of uh, a movement um, like we were talking about. Um, so, you know, that, that's a pretty diverse uh, kind of field there, but I think that um, this is a trend that I think more funders are, are interested in supporting and just helping you build your own capacity to do the work that, that to fulfill your mission. Yeah, I think that's right, Alice. I think, and you're right, it does tie back into several of the areas of interest we talked about earlier, you know, leadership development, shifting cultures, building movements, all of that, the, um, that sort of builds into that short term capacity building. I think that the key here is as an organization, just you need to be clear, are you talking about short term or long term? capacity building because you're going to be if you can if you complete those two if you confuse those two in your proposal the grant the funder will be confused as well so just be clear in your own mind am i am i asking for two and three year funding to allow me to accomplish these specific objectives or am i asking for longer term funding or not longer term funding but the funding that will address a longer term issue or movement shifting culture, that kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think one thing that I do preach a lot when it comes to capacity building, you know, the more that you can demonstrate in your proposals that the activities that you're doing to build your capacity, the more you can show that that's going to help you serve more people, serve different people, serve people better, more efficiently, all those kinds of things, the stronger your proposals will be. So showing not only the activities that you're going to do, but how that's going to help you into the future with, you know, just better services or more services or whatever it is that you're doing. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We're on the same team here, aren't we? Um, so, uh, yeah, and we, we, any questions you have about capacity building, I think both Cindy and I would love to talk with you about those. Um, so I'm just going to point you out to a couple of tools, um, and then we'll get to our questions. Um, but um, some of the free tools that GrantStation does offer that you can hop on the site right now to help you with, the, you know, doing all this uh, incredible work that we've been talking about. The first is the Insider. 
You can subscribe to the Insider and get free grant notices every week um, through our US uh, uh, Grant Station Insider. We have, I know we had some people that were international on, on the line, so you can also sign up for the International Insider and or the Canadian Insider. So just you get free, free funders uh, in your inbox every week for the US based and every month for international and Canadian. Um, we also have a tool, excuse me, called the Pathfinder. And the Pathfinder, you can go in and find all sorts of information in a really extensive database by just <clears throat> entering the type of information that you're looking for. And then it, it provides you with, the, with those links. And then our benchmarker tool, which, which is, is my a, favorite, Alice. Um, oh, well, I'll, you tell you, about let benchmarker me, then. Yeah, let me give your voice a break. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the benchmarker is really, you can go in, you can, we do a state of grant seeking survey every, um, every year. No, yeah, every year. And that state of grant seeking survey, usually we survey any place between 1,500 and 3,500 nonprofits. I mean, tons of people participate in the survey. And by the way, it's just coming out again. But you can read the benchmarker, you can read the state of grant seeking survey report. And then the benchmarker is a free tool you can use. You answer the questions and you can compare your organization. How are you doing in soliciting grant proposals? Um, it, and it gives you a little report. So it's a, it, it, you compare its missions and budgets and all that kind of thing. You'll love it. It's super fun to do. It is. It's a really great tool. Um, so anybody with or without a membership can get these tools here. And then um, just to kind of compare as well. So when we are looking at our databases that GrantStation offers, where you can find the funding sources that you're looking for, again, um, uh, U.S. charitable, Canadian charitable, international charitable, and then federal and state opportunities. Uh, we break our information down into areas of interest, like the funders, like we talked about areas of interest for funders. So you can look at your area and see what, what funders are available to support you there. And even under types of support, like general operating funds or, or capacity building funds, uh, you can also search by the target populations of those you serve and see who would support um, children or families or um, different target populations. And then we have different search parameters there. So um, when you're searching, it kind of does follow what, you know, some of the ways that Cindy and I were talking today. And then the other tool that's really great uh, is our R3 uh, tool, the revenue report review and report tool, where you can put in where you're getting your funds from. And you can either uh, look that into the future and look at where you want to get funds, or you can just analyze your current um, revenue streams, and it will help you um, develop strategies in order to diversify your funding or look at other strategies to um, uh, help you find additional funds. Um, so those tools you do have to have a membership for. Um, but before I do the question and answer, I'll just go... Uh, to this right here, that we do have the TechSoup promotion coming up the 14th and 15th, and those are those days only. Um, and if you are a US-based organization, it's $99 for a membership, which is a huge savings. And if you're a Canadian uh, organization, it's $141 Canadian dollars. Um, so the, that sale is just going on the 14th and 15th. Um, next week, we also have a free webinar with just to learn about all these tools that we're talking about at GrantStation. And so you can get on and see if a GrantStation membership is right for you, and you can see all the bells and whistles that we offer. So I'm going to take another drink of water and then have, see if Aretha has any questions for us. Yeah. David has been doing a great job at answering all the questions in the chat, but there are, I mean, in the Q&A, there are a few. From the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore, they want to know, are financial audits required prior to applying for and receiving grants? And if so, any recommendations on finding auditors? 
I will take that one. Um, and Cindy, maybe you could help on that auditor side, but um, financial audits are not required by every funder. So it's kind of specific to the funder if they require it or not. Um, what, I what I tend to do with organizations is if an audit is required and they don't have one, um, to reach out to the funder and see if there's any workaround, like that can you submit other documents in lieu of an audit? Um, and you'll just find that funders are either like, yes, you know, here's a workaround or no. And then in those kinds of cases, you then either need to find a partner or a, a fiscal agent or another agency to work with that would have the audit. Because if you just don't have it and it's required, then, um, then, you can't apply, but it is very funder specific as, as to if it's required or not. Um, and then kind of looking for auditors, Cindy, do you have anything on that? Um, I don't, Alice. Um, I don't have any specific auditors, but I do know that it's a it's pretty common for a big CPA firm to do pro bono work in the area of audits for nonprofits. So, I mean, I think I would start big, um, look at some of the big um, auditing firms in the area and see if they'll do a pro bono for you. Yep. And that is really the trend of, you know, corporate giving, that they are giving a lot of the time of their employees to work in community. Um, so that's a trend that has really stayed. So, you know, working to see if like their financial people can work on your audit is is a trend uh, in corporate giving. So it's it's always a good, you know, a good option to start to look at. Yeah, very helpful. An anonymous attendee said, when you feel like you're beating a dead horse and trying to educate and train your board members, how do you shift their culture? Any thoughts behind that? Uh, yeah. Go. Do you want to take this one, Cindy, and then I'll think? Yeah, you think. <laughs> it's important for you to think. Yes, I think, it is. I think thinking is good for you. <laughs> it is. Um, you can talk yeah. without thinking. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, it's just so interesting. Yeah, right. It's just so interesting that you brought this question up because it's exactly what I'm going through right now with a board I'm on. And it is... Um, it's not easy. I think, I think the important, you almost, you know, you, you can lead a horse to water, right? You can't make him drink. We already had the dead horse thing. We probably should stop with the horses. But um, I, I, I think what I've, what I've discovered is that sending articles, little educational pieces over to the board in general and saying, hey, what do you think of this? You know, what do you think of that? Um, and not don't be blatant about it because uh, you want to be manipulative. <laughs> I said that right out loud. Um, you know, you to, I mean, you have to, you know, it's an education process. And so bringing what I'm trying to do with the board I'm on is to make them understand that what we're, that our mission is fabulous, but this is, needs to be a movement not just we need to think out way outside the box here and so I think so what I've been doing is just trying to bring in little bits and pieces like we have one board member who manages um, our podcasts and he does all the interviews so I've you know lined up some people for him to interview that talk about this issue and so it it so it helps just to sort of bring it in from different angles, have someone do a guest blog for your organization, for your website, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Wish me luck. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of combining with the, the story I told about that internal shift. I mean, I think sometimes like, um, you know, providing information to people and then, but like doing it with like, member to member, you know, like it might start a little sh smaller and you're just kind of building a little internal team that kind of grows out from there. But that could also be, you know, instead of looking at the whole board at first, kind of like building, you know, building that culture with the four or five people who then spread out to the 10 um, could also be an option um, and like start, you know, start small and grow it out. 
Yeah, I like yeah. that. So Alice is na- Alice is nicer than I am. Both <laughs> I'm less manipulative than Sydney is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don had a couple questions, and then they were pretty much the same. He says that all of his um, efforts, he's in the U.S. He works in the U.S., but his products are used overseas. So his nonprofit is U.S. based, but his products are overseas. So how do he? change the direction toward people who work only in the US but have to ship their products overseas? That was his question. I'll, I'll hop in here, but Cindy, I mean, I kind of feel like a lot of these trends, um, you know, work, you know, within the US or externally as well. I mean, I think that that it really doesn't matter if it's you know US based or or with other countries that 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 people are still looking at you know again you know getting every voice heard in the room um working with the assets of all the different players that could come to the table um so i don't feel that much of this is only a US thing what do you think yeah, no, I agree. I think you're you're spot on, Alice. I think you're right. Um, the other thing that I want to mention to this this person is that when you do your funding research, you, you can look at funders based in the U.S., but also look at international funders because there are a lot of grant makers who might be interested in what you're doing. If you're if you're shipping something to Kenya, for example, we've got someone online from Kenya. So if you're shipping something, a product or a service to Kenya, you know that there's going to be a cross border kinds of funders that you should be looking at. So if you are a member of Grant Station, be sure and use that international database as well as the U.S. database. And you're going to find, um, I think, and David, uh, you may want to hop in here or Alice, I, I forget, but um, I believe you can also in the U.S. database base, say if you're working overseas or doing international funding too, or you're looking for international support to is that right i'm not entirely sure i guess in in the international one i know you can find that but i don't know if the u.s one but i can go look right now yeah do that i think it's a i think you can but i I think i think it's in both places yeah we have global okay we do we do we have there you go all right like yeah yeah you can search under global and then you'd find those that would support other countries as well Okay, good, good, yeah. good. I just yeah. want to make sure he's looking he's looking in the right places. <laughs> and Claire said, I appreciate all the points surrounding trending mo- movements, but can you expand more on strategies to seek out specific grants that align with these trends, like inclusivity and defending democracy, et cetera? Well, I think I'll, part of I'll, it is that go ahead, all those, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, Alice, you no, go you ahead because you're going to talk, you, we were going to say the same thing, I'm sure. I think a lot of these um, are listed in the areas of interest when you're doing your research on Grant Station. You can open up those. We have, I don't know, I can't remember you guys how many areas of interest we have. We have like, I don't know, 100, right? And um, you can find these these different things like democracy and and do a search on that particular, um, yeah that yep. particular area of interest. It's yeah, and same with type of support. If you're looking for capacity building, you can put it in that you're a you know a food bank in Montana looking for equipment um, and general operating support or something like that. You can put all those parameters in and it will bring up the funders that will do that. And at Grant Station we only Absolutely. profile grant makers that are actually in the game. In other words, they have to be um, actively accepting um, letters of intent or grant proposals, or if they yeah, or have a deadline coming up or something like that, we don't profile grant makers that actually would never give to you. So it's a it's a very vetted um, database of funders. Absolutely, and even some of those, I think some of these areas. I mean, I think that you're exactly right. I don't remember what your name was, but I, was, um, but I think you're right. You want to search, you know, for those that are defending democracy and those kinds of things. But even, you know, weaving those types of things in to other, you know, um, to to funders that don't specifically say that, I think also really yeah. adds a lot of, you know, a lot to your proposals. So I think yeah, certainly search for them. 
but then you don't, you know, you can take that to any community foundation and demonstrate how you're incorporating these things across the board. Yeah, Alice, I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things, if you take away nothing else from this this webinar, you guys, know that you don't have to be focusing on building a movement. You don't have to be focusing on shifting a culture. You don't have to be focusing on place-based philanthropy. You, what you want to do is weave this these considerations, these thoughts into your existing proposals because it will it will add so much credibility to to your request. Absolutely. Okay. And Jackie said, you mentioned that general operating grant funders want to know your challenges and struggles. Is this also true for capacity building grant funders? Oh, that's a great question, Jackie. I love it. Um, so one of the things that, again, when I'm teaching about writing capacity building grants, um, you know, that's the one time when you are talking about your organization and what its needs are. Um, whereas in other programmatic support, you're not necessarily, the need is external to your organization. Um, so I do like to encourage people to talk about what those strengths areas are that you have. So, you know, maybe you're very strong in leadership development and board development, um, but you're struggling with marketing as an area that you need, you know, to, to grow. Um, so I like to use um, different like organizational assessment tools to kind of demonstrate that need, you know, so you're, you, you know, you're talking about your strengths, you're keeping it, you know, um, where a funder would be like, yeah, this is a good organization, but then weaving in to that where you need that, that support to grow. And then again, the more you can show that if I have this better, you know, marketing plan or, you know, uh, volunteer development plan or what, whatever it is, that that can help me serve better in the future, serve more in the future, that kind of thing. So the more you can connect that directly. Um, but yes, you know, you, you do it in a positive light. Um, but but yes, you would talk about those areas that, that you're struggling with um, because hey, that's Alice, what your proposal is going to be about. Alice, what's a, if you say organizational assessment tools. Do you have any <laughs> favorites? You know, there are there are a number of them online that you can use. Um, and so that does kind of vary at different times. But if you guys um, you guys do have my contact information and I can send you links to like the free ones that are just kind of out there for anybody to use. Um, and then there's other ones that you might have to pay for by working with a company. But feel free to email me and I'm happy to send you um, examples of those tools that you Great. can use. Yeah. Um, so an anonymous attendee said, this is great, but you're leaving out a, a fundamental issue, time. Yeah. How much time is required and where do we get it? Where do we get the time? Cindy, do you want to take that one just because you have your whole yeah. time tutorial? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. there's, and, and seriously, you guys, I, I do a whole webinar on time, but, um, and where you find it and how you make, how you can write these proposals. But I'm going to give you one tip right off the bat, and that is if you don't have a lot of time, you don't have a lot of staff, or you know, you're mostly a volunteer organization, something like that, look for proposals that are that ask for like two to four pages of narrative. You know, don't try to go after the big bucks because you're gonna be writing a 20 or 30 page proposal. You're gonna to have to develop a whole plan. How do you do all that? You don't have time to do what you're doing now, right? So when, I, when I'm working with a smaller organization that doesn't have a dedicated staff to you know, writing grant proposals or even just to fundraising, I always suggest work on the easier ones upfront. And that, that will help you leverage more staff, which will then allow you to leverage your time so you can put more time into it. The other thing is, and I'll, I'll be very, very quick here. I always set up a, a fundraising, I, well, I set up a grant writing team and I've had as many as 17 people on that team. And I've had, right now I have a grant writing team for this organization I'm volunteering for. I think we have eight, uh, nine people and we're still building it out. So I have someone that's just dedicated to doing graphics for me. 
I have someone who's just dedicated to copy editing. I have someone who's just dedicated to putting the proposal together, organizing all the bits and pieces, making sure we've dotted, you know, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. So I put together a fund a, and a grant writing team, mainly made up of volunteers from outside um, the organization, people that are looking to improve their skill sets, whether it's in graphics or, you know, organizational development or whatever. So that those are two tips. Excellent. Um, Alice, did you want to say anything? You know, I'm just going to add one thing really quick, but it is just uh, what I also like to do when teaching grant writing is to show you how to use a framework um, to put all the pieces yeah. together of an application and how you can weave all these things in, right, that we've been talking about that are all floating up here. How do you put those in your planning framework and get everything planned out? If you do that bit of upfront work, then you can take this information and pluck it out of the planning and 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 submit it to 10 different funders the way they want to see it. So I really believe that that you can maximize um, your time um, and, and get more proposals written if you kind of follow that planning strategy. Um, and that's what I teach in all of my webinars. How do we do that planning so that the writing isn't so challenging and take as much time? So just a plug for maybe some of our future webinars if you want to participate in that. Awesome. Cindy, earlier you had asked that people put in the chat like what kind of grants they're working on. So John put in the Q&A, he said, we're working to expand and grow our Student Leadership Academy. Um, it's a leadership development tool, presents more of a professional package, better videos and extending opportunity to other communities and areas. You want to provide him some feedback on where he can search for some grants? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it, it in the grant station database, there are you're going to. I mean, Alice, you correct me, David, you correct me if I'm wrong, but he's going to be overwhelmed with the number of grant makers that are be interested in funding something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, what he's doing is right. Is it, it is it is hot. It is a hot topic right now. Taking we need to train the next generation. We need to bring these students up. We need to create these leaders. So I think that you're going to find dozens and dozens and dozens of grant makers that will fund this. Don't be, um, don't focus too much on just your, you know, if you're based in, I don't know, in Ohio, don't just focus on Ohio grant makers. Make sure you're looking at national funders that are doing this kind of thing, because even though it may affect only a small you know, portion of the United States, a lot of these national funders are looking for these kinds of very focused um, development projects. So I, I would look, you know, be sure and look broadly as well. I mean, I could sit here and list a dozen grant makers today, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay, Laura says, more than once, my grant was met with the response that the organization is looking to give a grant to a more established nonprofit with the history of success. How does one show this type of history of success as a startup? I just make it up. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing to, one thing you can do is to partner with a more established organization and submit proposals together. And they take on a little bit of what you're trying to do and they get a little bit of the money. But in, in general, they they can bring your credibility way, way up if you're a new startup. Alice, do you have thoughts? No, I do like that idea of, of that partnering. And then, you know, that that they that a funder would be able to see that you've done the work. Um, and and yet, you know, because you just don't have the track record yet, this other organization would get the dollars that you would then implement the project. Um, and, and I think that at first you do have to really probably focus a little bit more internally as you're, as you're reaching out, like, like the strength of the board that got together to develop this or organization, you know, like yep. that's going to have to be a stronger emphasis in a new organization or why this approach that you've developed is just you know, uh, well-researched, well-documented to be effective, you know, 
those kinds of things, I think you have to just highlight a whole lot more um, because they can't base it off your past track record, you know, and you can just really focus on the strengths of what you have developed and then develop that yeah, trust and, that you were talking about and all that. And I also think that um, especially a lot of grant makers don't want to give you a, a, a grant award because they're not sure of your fiscal your ability to fiscally, you know, manage it. And so you may want to look at a fiscal sponsor. And again, I can't remember the name of that website, Alice, um, but there is a website just to go on Google, you guys look up fiscal sponsor. It's an association and they, they provide fiscal sponsorship for, especially for startups, uh, new organizations like yours. And if you can't find it, just email me too, because I have some of that information too. So on that. Says, have you encountered any efforts successful in attracting funders that would assist returning citizens with small grants or start small businesses? Many times, business owners, um, business ownership is most viable path to earning sustainable income. I'll 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 start on that one a little bit. So there are not a lot of grants for for profit organizations out there. Um, you're going to want. Uh, if you're going to find anything, you're going to be want to, you know, look under the Small Business Association and that sort of thing for those types, you know, of support that they might provide. Um, and I had one other thought that I just lost when I can't see the question. Um, sorry, let me go back. I got it. And then I'll most viable path. Oh, and then I would look at, sorry, Cindy, I would look at different um, CDFIs, the Community mm -hmm. Financial yes development institution, I think that is it. Um, and, yep. and those are really, those. it's federal money that's given to these intermediary organizations who then help build the capacity of nonprofits and for-profits. Um, so it might not be a grant, it could be a loan or whatever, or just technical assistance, but those CDFIs are really geared to help um, small businesses as well. And I would just, I would add to that, that if, um, you know, as, as an organization, perhaps become a member of the Social Enterprise Alliance, because a lot of what you're doing is helping these organ these people start small businesses, and many of them are social enterprises. And then um, the CDFI really comes into play there, as does the, uh, like the social finance finance fund out of California. I mean, there's a bunch of social finance funders out there that are doing, um, and they fund uh, small businesses. You, you don't have to be a nonprofit as well as um, nonprofit organizations. And again, if you're a grant station member, just be sure and click uh, on social enterprises when you're doing your research, and you'll be able to find some interesting funders for the work that you're doing. Awesome. Randall said, we are a new nonprofit and one grantee said they like what we do, but are concerned we will fold and their money will be wasted. How do we convince them otherwise? I would answer that with kind of demonstrating uh, to that funder what your kind of sustainability plan is. Just letting them know that you have other, you know, even if you don't have it in hand, that you have strategies there to um, support the work that you're doing ongoing. Um, Cause it does make sense that a funder would ask that question. Like if I give you this $50,000 now, how do I know that you're going to be there in the future and that, or I didn't just waste $50,000. So I think anything that you can do to show what your long-term financial strategies are, the steps that you're taking to, you know, um, get other donors or to do fundraisers or to, you know, reach out for more grant opportunities or whatever. I think that that that's, you know, some of those the strategies I would use to try to 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 talk them into it. And I also think that earned income plays a, a, an important role there. So depending on the kind of organization you are, you may be, you may be, be able to develop an earned income revenue stream and I think that earned income revenue stream can say more than just about anything else because you can say you're going to go after grant funding, but in truth, you know, if you're going to get it or not, they're debating, right? So you want, but an earned income stream of some sort, whether it's 
trainings or a product you're going to produce or whatever it is that is going to give is going to assure them probably more than just about anything else oops i think you are muted aretha i was thank you <laughs> last two tony says our foundation is looking for funding for general operating support so we can serve more of our constituents and also for K-12 teacher scholarships for these teachers to go through training to write smaller foundation grants proposals. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I have one and that is, if you're trying to set up a scholarship fund of any kind, it's always smart to do a corporate campaign. And so that court, and it should be an annual campaign and you do it every year. And the campaign is just to endow that scholarship fund. And so you look at the, the businesses, the corporations that might be interested in the area where you're giving the scholarships and, and you go after those as potential funders. And I would do it every year. Um, I've done that many times with many organizations over the years. And they built scholarships that were the scholarship funds that were as small as $10,000 up into a million dollars or more now. So, you know, you just have to be persistent. Uh, corporate campaigns, a great way to raise money around any kind of scholarship program you may offer. Well, I wanna thank you all for being here today. There was a question that David just answered, but I think it's worth um, somebody chiming in. Somebody wants to know after they do the $99 promotion, what happens after that? I don't know. <laughs> we'll let yeah, you stay. It's downhill. <laughs> no. So we we do have renewal uh, programs that you can do. So every year, you know, if, if you uh, want to renew your subscription or your membership, um, you can renew it annually. Um, you can even renew it through TechSoup, right? Aretha, like if you did it through TechSoup yes. last time, you just go on and renew. Um, you know, through the new promotion, that'll be the 14th and 15th. Um, and um, yeah, and if you, you know, um, yeah, so that's, that's what you do. You just renew it um, every year. And so you can renew it every year. Here's another question that just popped in. Um, you, after you buy it one year for $99, you can buy it the next year for $99. So that can just be a constant um, renewal. If you don't hit the TechSoup, um, renewal thing, we generally send you uh, uh, an invitation to do your renewal at a really reduced price as well. So you would get that from us um, saying, oh, your memberships, um, uh, and, and it would probably be at our general rate, just right now is 179 um, during our promotional times. Uh, normally 699, but during our promotional times is 179. Um, and and so. I, I would just mention, I would also just mention that once you become a member of GrantStation, you'll be able to log in and you've got all these databases and tools you can use. We have tons of writing tools, tons of samples. We have a proposal, a winning proposal contest that we run every other year. We have tons of winning proposals posted on the website for you to review so you can get an idea of how other people have done it. Um, we have, you know, step-by-step -step tutorials on how to write the need statement and the budget and the, you know, every, all the different components of a grant proposal, how to build a grant strategy. Um, there's just tons of tools and resources embedded in the site once you become a member. And uh, we have a very high renewal rate. So I think you'll be, I think you'll be happy. And I got to go to another meeting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you, David, in the background. You've been awesome. Cindy, as always, thank you so much for being here. And Alice, thank you for all what you do. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone.